the founder of VAIR, an environmental education organization founded to promote low carbon tourism. Natalie Chung will share with us her climate advocacy journey. Natalie, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Are you energized from the break? Are you ready for a 15 minute talk on climate change? When we think of youth and climate, obviously one girl comes to mind. That is the powerful Greta Thunberg. She started striking for the future every Friday, sitting outside of the government hall, saying that the government should care more about climate change, the climate crisis. And from that, she moved on to mobilizing millions of school children around the world to join her movement, forming the prominent international climate movement Fridays for Future. And even, she gained a seat at high-level UN conferences, telling government leaders, politicians, the importance to listen to youth because we are part of the future and they are leaving the planet for us. And Greta's impact is not only in the European region, she actually influenced one little boy here in the middle of the photo. He's Lance Lau. He listened to Greta's story, and he started to imitate what Greta is doing. He was striking every Friday at his very local Cantonese-speaking school in Hong Kong. And at the beginning, he was scolded up by all the teachers. But later on, he started to explain his rationale to the peers around him and gathered a small group of people. You can recognize this is the uh, Leshko complex. And they were holding signs telling people why they're doing it. Because if there's no future, why do they still have to go to school? What I'm talking about have been much more focused on activism. They're doing something to raise mass attention, raise public awareness. But oftentimes, it is criticized by the academia that it is not that constructive. Politicians, yes, they attend UN conferences and they listen to their speeches. Does anything change? This is a very encouraging photo highlighting a hopeful moment in my climate journey. It is uh, the Carbon Care InnoLab. They sent a team of six youths to the international UN climate conference COP26 earlier last year. Before that, Hong Kong did not even have an official delegation at the COP conferences, but the scene has changed so much with a group of six youths they're doing policy advocacy, one step further from activism. They're writing policy intervention papers day and night. They're chatting with country negotiators, understanding the problems faced by least developed countries and what Hong Kong as a city can support them. Well, after defining the topic and what's the difference between activism and advocacy, I would share a little bit about my why, um, the golden circle of why I'm doing what I'm doing. The story goes back to at a very, very young age when I was in primary school. Can you spot which one is me in the photo? <laughs> it's actually the rightmost one. I'm the short uh, little girl, late to puberty. Um, so I was luckily participating in a school project on climate change helped by the Hong Kong Observatory. And my teacher, being a very passionate uh, young woman, she actually cold called Dr. Rebecca Lee who's the first woman in Hong Kong and first woman in the world who have been to the three poles, essentially an explorer. Um, so she called her Dr. Lee, asking if she can give a small tour to us to inspire us, tell us what is climate change, because she was at the frontier when nobody was even talking about the word climate change. We were just talking about global warming at that time, like 10 plus years ago. Since then, um, I was very inspired, not just uh, the photographs she's taken of the melting glaciers at the poles, but also this image, uh, which we drew from what she described. She described our Earth as a planet trapped in a microwave with continually rising temperature. This was a very powerful tool of visualization. I never envisioned we were actually living in a burning furnace in a microwave, and if this issue is so urgent, what are we doing about it? And what can we do about it? And I guess after that anecdote, this sense of environmentalism or stewardship blossomed in my life. And I started to um, pay attention to news related to climate change, global warming. But more importantly, at university, I had an opportunity to join a hackathon. It was organized by the French consulate right before the COP21 Paris Climate Conference. 
They were trying to gather a group of tertiary school students to think of solutions to help Hong Kong decarbonize as quickly as possible. We thought um, about a lot of things like energy, how do we save more energy? But everyone knows you need to switch off lights after you leave a room, right? And we were thinking a bit outside of the box. Is there one kind of emission that nobody has been talking a lot about it yet? Well, it's the elephant in the room, air traveling. We realized that 25% of per capita emission uh, of Hong Kong people comes from traveling abroad. Of course, it includes business traveling and personal leisure traveling, and business traveling takes up around 80%. Well, and we were thinking, what about for the portion of leisure traveling? It was still quite extensive at that time in 2015 when people wanted to go abroad uh, for a weekend ramen or sushi. Can we lead them to see the other side of Hong Kong that is not yet explored? Given that over three quarters of our land is still green belt, and there are so many hidden gems and treasures around Hong Kong. So we designed the solution of FAIR, uh, which means green in French, the word FAIR. Um, our impact model is to start from providing eco tours. We go and guide people out in the field, out in nature, to really touch and feel um, the power of nature and ecology and biodiversity. And this is how we conduct our public education. We believe by taking people out, um, just like in Disneyland, uh, when they go into a magical kingdom, they understand about the art of innovation. And in nature, you understand how inferior, um, how humble humans are compared with Mother Earth. And then we enlighten people, eventually empowering them to take up the responsibility of serving the planet and to spread this message to even more people across the world. And very fortunately, Kenny allowed us to organize a joint discovery session with Mellow Fellows. And this is a photo of us in the blue fair t-shirts taking Mellow Fellows to Kokpo and Lokkeng. How many of you have been to these places apart from the fellows? Lokkeng, Tong Kokpo, Yamwan Hergole, like two Hakka villages in Hong Kong near Sha Tao Kok. Yep, so I, I, I see not many number of hands. This generation of youths, especially during the social movement, a lot of us talk about the notion of we love Hong Kong. But what do we actually love about Hong Kong? Do we love about the nature? If you only know one quarter of the whole of Hong Kong, so are you loving the ideology? Or have we actually defined what Hong Kong means to the younger generation or to the future generation? Because these natural assets are what we will bring on to the future. And this uh, showcase a magazine we produced last year. Uh, we gathered a group of Hakka villages. We did in-person field trips and interviews with them. We were collecting a lot of stories, authentic human stories. What do these people living in the rural areas think about the future of sustainable tourism? Do they actually want more people to come? Or do they prefer a tranquil environment where they can retire? And one interesting thing uh, we brought up from this uh, magazine interview is actually um, in the Lokan Kopo area, now Kopo village is only accessible by walking. You need to walk over an hour um, up and down the hill. It's not very accessible, especially to older people. So now there are around 10 people living there and they actually proposed to the district council, we can build an extended walkway uh, along the Chateau Coxy, which can become an immense tourism asset to Hong Kong. But the district council said no. They said the budget is too high because when you divide by 10 people, um, the budget is around 20 million Hong Kong dollar, which is not a high amount of money. But when you divide it by 10 people, so you're only benefiting 10 people, it's not worth it. But when we take a grand look, and if we're able to encourage more Hong Kong people visit this place responsibly and sustainably, we're able to unleash this potential to redefine and redevelop our rural area, which is an important cultural and natural asset and heritage of the Hong Kong future population. COVID-19 has been a wake-up call to a lot of corporates, to a lot of schools, uh, to a lot of youngsters. We see COVID as the first wave of impact. But what's behind COVID is recession, it's climate change, it's biodiversity collapse. A lot of the causes of COVID is actually 
joint causes for climate change. Increasing air pollution will increase mortality rate of COVID. And deforestation also reduces our boundary and reduces our distance from wildlife animals, leading to more infectious and animal-borne diseases being spread. And even World Economic Forum identifies top 10 global risk for the next 10 years. Climate change, biodiversity collapse, and extreme weather events are among the top three. Talking about the past and present, we now move on to the future. So in the future, what kind of perception we should take to regenerate and to find out a solution for all these detrimental climate crises? This is an image which inspired me a lot. It is the first photograph human see planet as a whole. This photo is called the Earthrise, um, taken from the moon uh, by Apollo in 1968. This is essentially us looking into the planet, recognizing the boundary. Resources are not infinite. We understand that the Earth functions as a living system. It is not alienated from us. It functions as a whole, and we are part of this, just like any other species on the planet. Another inspiration that we can draw from nature is a recent creation of solar panels in the States. They are planting the solar panels in a way that resembles the sunflower seed pod. This is called biomimicry, where we learn from wisdom of nature. By positioning the solar panels in this way, we can maximize the insulation and maximize the efficiency. So a lot of design, can we integrate them more with nature and learn from nature-based solutions to solve our climate crisis? This is essentially the theory of moving from an extractive to a regenerative economy. We're moving away from the view of seeing all resources as asset. We extract fossil fuel from the ground, we burn out forests to, into pasture land, into farmland. But a regenerative economy is something that rejuvenates itself. We do something that can both benefit us and benefit the planet. Take the ocean as an example. The ocean holds over 60% of carbon of our planet. If we're able to unleash the potential of ocean, of mangroves, and wetland ecosystem. We do not have to spend so much money on direct air capture, on other CCS technology. Ending on the remark, whether I'm hopeful about the climate future and whether I'm hopeful that climate change can be solved, given that we have all these targets of um, China pursuing carbon neutrality by 2060 and Hong Kong's target as 2050, I remember at the COP26 conference, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he shared a quote. This quote is directed to most affected people in climate change, the underprivileged group, youth groups, and women. He said, I know many of you are disappointed with the resolution of COP26 of not being ambitious enough, not getting us to 1.5 degrees. But the path of progress is not always a straight line. And sometimes there are detours. Of course, for me, I also encountered a lot of detours. At a young age, I was put on a lot of social norms. I clearly remember when I was submitting my Jupiter's choices for university, my teachers kind of asked me out uh, of the classroom saying that, Natsli, you're the only one who are putting geography in your choices. Uh, why should you do that? And I think you're more suitable for law not only my teachers, my relatives, they all said the same thing. But I thought, if we're going to do something well, we need to do it with our heart, with our passion. And if I know that I have this calling from a young age, then I should go for it. And I went on. And next up, we joined a lot of startup competition as part of FAIR. And of course, we lost in a lot of them. One of the judges in the panel said, so now you're guilt trapping me for traveling. I travel every weekend, so that was um, the only reason that he really hated our idea. To everyone here who travels, we just want to make a small disclaimer. We don't ban personal traveling or anything. We want people to really explore and understand the intrinsic value of and beauty of Hong Kong's nature. And by doing so, we evoke the intrinsic motivation for them to stay here. You stay here not because we don't let you travel, but you stay here because there is still so much to explore. And I guess the past two years of COVID have given us the same message. 
the final line uh, following that quote is, he said, even though we're disappointed, but we're in the fight for our lives. It is a matter of life and death. So we must keep fighting. We must never retreat. I'd like to leave you all with one last quote to ponder upon is, there are no passengers on the spaceship Earth. We are all crew. We are all part of this together. Thank you.